Susan McGee Bailey is a feminist researcher, writer, and activist. Following college, she taught in Asia, Latin America, and the United States, and her experiences fostered her commitment to gender equitable education as a cornerstone of active citizenship. She's the principal author of the AAUW report, How Schools Shortchange Girls. She directed the Resource Center on Educational Equity at the Council of Chief State School Officers in Washington, DC, and the Policy Research Office on Women's Education at Harvard University. She directed the Wellesley Centers for Women at Wellesley College for 25 years before retiring in 2011. Susan has written and lectured widely on women, public policy, and gender equitable education, and received numerous awards for research and public advocacy, and has been frequently quoted in the media and appeared on radio and television. And in 2011, the National Council for Research on Women spotlighted her as a feminist icon. Also, as a single mother of a developmentally and physically challenged daughter, she has been active um, in a variety of community organizations addressing the needs of disabled children and adults. So her writing ha has recently addressed the many ways mothering and feminism contribute to and strengthen each other. And when asked about her recent writing, Susan acknowledged that she has always been interested in writing and wrote plays and stories as a child. And only recently has she had more time to pursue seriously her writing. And at presently, she writes short stories and blogs. And she writes regularly for the group feminist blog, Girl with Pen. When I asked Susan, why do you think we have art? She noted, to reveal truth in ways that reach people on more than a single level. And with that, I would like to invite you to give a warm welcome to Susan McGee Bailey. Thank you, Cheryl. And um, it's wonderful to be here this morning. Um, this is the first time that I've ever read any of my more uh, personal essays and reflections in public. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. I've, as Cheryl said, I've been writing about mothering and feminism, the way they strengthen each other, and I've been particularly interested in trying to uh, bring in the voices of two women who very much have influenced my life and my feminism. The first is my daughter Amy, and the second is a woman named Miss Fulton, whom I met as of, I now know she was 78 when I met her, and I was a young child. I'm going to read two uh, brief vignettes from some of my writing that I've linked together for this morning and called Learning from Amy. My daughter Amy was born in 1970, the same year Shulamith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex and Robin Morgan's anthology Sisterhood is published, is powerful, was published. Betty Friedan's feminine mystique had already become a part of my daily conversation. I read everything I could about women's liberation. It all made so much sense. My husband and I agreed we would share parenting. Our family wouldn't follow the usual gender patterns. We'd be equal partners, and we'd steer our daughter clear of sex stereotype toys and expectations. A huge cultural shift was underway. We'd be part of it. We have been, but not in the ways I anticipated 40 years ago. Children complicate lives in unexpected ways. Amy was born with a variety of disabilities, some immediately evident, others less so. She tested our facile feminism. We chose different answers. I'm a single parent. Since her birth more than 40 years ago, Amy has survived complicated surgeries, spent endless hours and months in rehab centers and therapies, endured painful, long-term interventions. But like most interventions, most individuals, excuse me, with developmental and physical challenges, there's no single diagnosis. No silver bullet that can address all her medical, emotional, and intellectual disabilities. 
Parenting a child with physical and developmental challenges is a politicizing activity. Mothering such a child alone is a radicalizing one. It requires not only the culturally sanctified female roles of caregiving and traditional good mothering, but aggressive, independent action. You must lobby the legislature, argue with the doctor, defy the teacher. And oddly, while these unfeminine behaviors might in other circumstances be deemed deviant or too aggressive, performed in the context of mothering a child with special needs, they're considered appropriate, even laudable. But for a single mother, even this culturally permissible deviance is insufficient. My life with Amy has been different from the lives of my colleagues and friends. I could not provide emotional, physical, and financial support for Amy without re-envisioning motherhood. Amy and I have lived with an assortment of male and female students, with employed and unemployed women, some with, others without children. Work for me is not possible without round-the-clock care for Amy. This is true for all mothers and children, but it is a need that most outgrow. Not so in our case. Amy fuels my passion for feminist solutions, not simply for childcare, but for policy issues across the board. I know firsthand too many of the dilemmas confronting women, from the mostly invisible workers who care for others in exchange for poverty level wages, to successful businesswomen struggling to be perfect mothers, perfect wives, powerfully perfect CEOs. But to write of motherhood without sharing the lessons and joy Amy offers every day is only part of the story. My particular good fortune is in Amy's special way of seeing the world. Abstractions usually elude her and her syntax is awkward, but Amy's pronouncements are full of energy. She rarely misses the wonders she finds all around. The smell of cookies, the rhythms of a Beatles song, the shimmer of silver as a fish glides past the aquarium glass. She notices, and she insists that others notice. Oh, the sky, look at the sky. The clouds are rushing. Where are they going? Mother, hold that big door. I see two babies. Hold the door for those cutest babies. One day last winter as I was folding laundry, Amy was particularly insistent. Mother, come here, now. Oh, Amy, please, I'm busy. I'll be there in a minute. No, now. Redbird will fly away. Come now. I hurried to see Redbird. What kind of silly person would think it reasonable to miss a cardinal in the snow? In various ways, Amy reminds me of my first best friend, Miss Georgiana Fulton. Miss Fulton was an artist, a recluse, and somewhat eccentric. It was Miss Fulton who first taught me my feminist lessons about women's struggle for the right to vote, about the importance of, sharing, of standing up for what you believe in. Like Amy, Miss Fulton was low on patience and spoke her mind without regard for polite conventions. This next ex excerpt begins with a conversation with Amy on a trip to visit my sister in Mystic, Connecticut. Sitting beside me in the front seat of the car, Amy was pointing out places she recognized. There's her house. There's your friend's house. Right, Mom? I was startled. Yes, Amy, that's where Miss Fulton lived. How did you remember that? She grinned. You said me that, Mom. You said that one time. My head, Mom. My head is working. Her voice took on a sing-song lilt for the last four words. It's a phrase she loves to say. Sometimes it comes frequently. Other times days go by with only an angry, my head is not working. But that early fall day a few years ago was a good day. The drive down to my sister's from Wellesley was easy with little traffic. We arrived in Mystic early. Amy, we're early. Where would you like to drive before we go to Aunt Lori's? Go over the bridge, Mom. I like that bridge. The small bridge spans the causeway leading to Mason's Island where I grew up. On the spur of the moment, I decided to follow the road all the way to my mother's house. We'd rented it to strangers since her death several years earlier. I hadn't considered that Amy might remember the road with such detail, 
but her long-term memory often surprises me. She has trouble retaining a name she's heard a few minutes before, but can describe clearly things that occurred months or even years earlier. I laughed to myself, recalling the first time Miss Fulton and I met. It was springtime, and my family had only recently moved to the island. Every day on our walk to and from the school bus stop, we passed her ramshackled cottage. The other kids thought she was crazy. She was lots older than our parents, and she lived alone, without indoor plumbing or much in the way of furniture. There were rumors of a pet turkey buried in her yard. But I couldn't resist ga gla gazing at her flowers as I walked by. Jonquils, violets, sweet-smelling hyacinths were everywhere. One day she was standing by her gate. Girl, come over here. I see you peering into my yard every day. What are you looking at? Her long dress was old-fashioned, worn and faded. Silvery hair escaped from a bun at the back of her neck. She wasn't exactly smiling, but she didn't seem all that scary. I noticed Amy looking at me as I squirmed a little in the car, recalling my embarrassment that day and my stuttering reply, I, I, I like your flowers. Well then, don't just stand there, child. Come in and look at them. But watch where you step. Tom is buried over by the hyacinths. <laughs> the other kids scattered. My brother pulled on my arm. Miss Fulton opened the gate. You've been invited in, girl. What else do you like besides flowers? Amy interrupted my thoughts. Mom, what are you thinking? Don't think about work today. Only think about Amy. I'm thinking about my friend Amy and about when I was a little girl. Oh, OK. How old, Mom? You have to tell me, too. Not just think to self. I was almost eight, Amy. And I'm remembering how Uncle Hugh didn't want me to go into her yard. But you did, right, Mom? <laughs> Yes, Amy, I did. My daughter knows me so well sometimes. She'd sense that defying my brother would be my choice. Amy turned contentedly back to the car window as I slipped again into that long ago day. So, you like school. That's fine. We can talk about school. You stop by tomorrow with your school books. I'd be interested in those books. Uh, okay, I will, I mean, if I can, if I have time, if, no ifs, girl. Either you do or you don't. I'll be here. And she was. Just as I thought, the illustrations in this book are an insult to a child's native intelligence, not a speck of a dream in the entire book. I wasn't quite sure what she meant. Dreams were what you had at night or read about in storybooks. How could pictures be dreams? I'll tell you something, child. I worked for a textbook publisher in New York once. I fired them. <laughs> this made even less sense. How could you do that? You said you worked for them. Ah, a stickler for detail. Well, that's not always a bad thing, I guess. Just don't let it get in your way. It can kill the imagination. Enough, mother. Amy was back in the moment and insisting I join her. Talk to me now. Sure, honey. I was just thinking and remembering. Remember, mom? Remember when I lost my bracelet at my school? Remember? Pete stole it. If I am remembering something from the past, she would too. Of course, I don't remember. I wasn't there. I can't recall or corroborate a stolen bracelet. Amy's sense of time is emotional, not chronological. She often begins conversations with, remember. Remember when I went to the beach? Remember I went to the store? Or remember I rode in that little car? She is remembering, wants to tell her story. It confuses people. At times I feel the need to explain. Amy wants to tell you a story. It doesn't mean that you remember. It's that she is remembering. Some people get it immediately. Others never manage to grasp that it is totally unnecessary to insist that no, they were not there. No, they cannot remember. 
They don't understand that there's no need to go into the precise specifics of how they could not have been there at that particular time, at that particular place. When this happens, I'm reminded of Miss Fulton's warning, her warning about the dangers of insisting on details. Some people end up with no imagination. Those are my two vignettes. Thank you very much. This March, when I wrote this, the cold bites sharply, wounding us in a new way. Through the endless frozen season, we had gotten used to being perpetually chilled, but now, because it's theoretically, astronomically spring, the wind stings us personally, like a rebuke, a slap reminding us that winter still reigns. The calendar itself confuses. A solar eclipse makes the day disappear. A new moon makes the night deeper. Both cosmological events arrive on March 20th, tipping this strangest equinox toward the dark rather than the light. Lumpy snow mounds, aforementioned, had begun to shrink, but they stopped in mid-reveal, a striptease frozen. Familiar hard edge shapes had begun to emerge on my deck, a solid horizontal band suggests a table's rim. In the woods, first a tiny bronze moon, then a hand, then an arm lifting it up, rise from the white surround. Half a dancing goddess statue returns. I recognize a stone wall, an aging bird feeder, stiff raspberry stalks. But I remember another deep winter more than two decades ago. I remember my kneecaps revealing themselves when my pregnancy weight waned. I recognized knuckles and ankles that had gone missing. Puffy, rounded flesh had covered us, cushioning my cargo and me. Suddenly, I had become bony and vulnerable, terrified for my naked baby.
Peach and pear.